Most of tonight's stories are set on the high seas, but I'd like to start by looking at those treasures and the curiosities that the Captainess and her crew may have sailed in search of, and a remarkable collector who helped kick off the age of empirical science. As CJ mentioned, the Captainess's ship is named the Aldrovanda, a lovely and poetic name, taken from a peculiar carnivorous sea plant. Named, in turn, after a man of unmatched curiosity who tried, and almost succeeded, to collect the whole world. His name <laughs> was Alyssi Aldrovandi. He was one of the greatest minds of his generation, a curious-minded hoarder of oddities, and perhaps the greatest natural scientist you've never heard of. To explore this story, I want to go back to 1594 when a very special little girl visited the great university city of Bologna. Her father had been raised the royal household of Henry II and Catherine de' Medici in France, and he was now part of the, she was now part of the household of the Duke of Parma, and she'd been sent to visit the Marquesa of Saronia in a town near Bologna. She was dressed in the absolute finest, most up-to-date fashions, with the manners of one born to privilege. She was only eight years old, but she made a lasting impression on everyone she met. Lavinia Fontana, one of the finest portrait artists of the era, who, side note, was a university-educated um, university career artist at the height of the Renaissance, who only agreed to marry if her husband agreed to stay home and take care of the children so that she could continue to make art. <laughs> She was there to capture her likeness for a portrait. But it wasn't just noble ladies and artists that met this little girl. Alessio Aldrovandi, who was a professor of natural history at the university, arrived to slake his seemingly endless curiosity. Because Antonietta Gonzalez was special, not only because she was part of a ducal household or because she was beautifully turned out, but because she was fabulously luxuriously furry. <laughs> this is the portrait that was created by Lavinia Fontana, which now hangs at the Chateau de Blois. It was apparently one of Catherine de' Medici's favorite things. As a collector of marvels, Aldrovandi jumped at an opportunity to meet this living marvel, a real, otherwise ordinary girl, afflicted with an extremely rare genetic disorder known as hypertrichosis, which caused her whole body, body to be covered in a dense golden fur. He recorded the visit with Antonietta in what would go on to be his most famous work, a collection of all the monsters in the world called the Monstorum Historia, which is in print in Italian, it was written in Latin, in print in Italian for the first time ever last year. Um, for this, he commissioned this woodblock illustration and a second rendering in color. In her hand, she holds a letter telling the story of her unusual family. But he was so charmed by this young lady, so taken, that what he really wanted was a proper portrait, like the one that Lavinia had painted. So he had one commissioned, and he hung it in a place of honor in his collection, directly opposite portraits of his own family. <clears throat> Bologna. Uh, Aldrovandi himself was born in 1522. He grew up in Bologna at the tail end of the Renaissance, just before the blossoming of the scientific revolution that would come a generation later. I apologize, my voice is very... Scaracci. Okay. The city of Bologna was an excellent place for a curious-minded person to grow up. It's home to the oldest university in continuous operation in the world, founded in 1088. By Aldrovandi's day, it was a cosmopolitan hub of intellectual curiosity. As a young man, he studied medicine and law, but during a brief stint holed up in house arrest in Rome on charges of heresy, different story, charges were dropped, <laughs> he found himself fascinated by the local community of natural historians working in Rome, who were creating great encyclopedias of the living world. This newfound fascination changed the path of his life. The work they were doing, and the work that Aldrovandi would take on as his life's mission, was complicated. They lived at a time of profound changes, when what was known began to be questioned seriously, 
and where every day new marvels were arriving into Europe from the far ends of the earth. <clears throat> in Aldrovandi's lifetime, people, even smart people, people we would call scientists, believed in some pretty weird stuff. From our vantage point, it might be easy to dismiss some of these monsters from Ulysses' collection as not real. Dragons, the basilisk, unicorns, mermaids, or werewolves. I'd like to point out that this particular unicorn has little webbed feet, which I like a whole lot. Um, but part of the problem was a lack of reliable source material. These early naturalists were largely drawing conclusions from two primary sources. The wisdom written of supposedly trustworthy ancients like Aristotle and Pliny, and travelers' tales of high adventure, fresh off the deck of seafaring ships. But everyone knows you shouldn't trust sailors' stories, right? But then, the real world turns out to give us some pretty weird options because, like, if you met a sailor who had just come back from Africa and he told you about this giraffe he saw, and he told you that it was 16 feet tall with spots like a leopard and hooves like a deer and a long black tongue, something like horns but with pom-poms on the top, and oh, they fight with their neck. Or God help you. Someone tries to convince you that the platypus is real with mammal fur and a duck's beak, lays eggs and has poisonous spurs, and is in fact biofluorescent for some reason. You'd be like, cool story, bro. So it could be in fact hard to know who is reporting back about amazing cool shit and who is in fact full of shit. So Aldrovandi did what any reasonable person might do. He decided to collect everything. Today, when people mention a cabinet of curiosities, often what people picture is an item of furniture, a literal cabinet. That is not what Aldrovandi created. His cabinet was so much more than that. It was a building's worth of objects, several rooms filled to the ceilings with specimens, more of a natural history museum than anything else. And Aldrovandi's wasn't the only one. A passion for collecting rare and odd items spread through the late 1500s and 1600s. A network of correspondence traded ideas and objects across surprising distances and language barriers, and the great work of debunking myth began. They applied themselves to the big questions. Was the provocatively shaped coco de mer the seed of a gigantic undersea plant? Did birds of paradise spend their entire lives aloft with no feet to hold them to trees? <laughs> Was it possible that Norwegian lemmings spontaneously generated in storm clouds? <laughs> Could one use a bezoar, a concreted hairball found in the stomach of ruminants, as a poison antidote at the dinner table? And a question that we are still asking to this day, what the fuck narwhals? <laughs> Doing this work just drove them to ask more questions because what they had discovered was a specific portal that drives curiosity, something called the known unknown. Our curiosity about things exists on a spectrum. And it's very difficult to be, to be curious about unknown unknowns, which are things that you have absolutely no idea about. And we tend not to be terribly curious about known knowns, things that we know all the things about. But these strange and sometimes miraculous objects, these impossible animals and third-hand reports of improbable but wonderful things, these occupy the sweet spot, a middle space of known unknowns. They are the things that you know only a tantalizingly small thing, amount about. And it creates a vacuum, a void, that we want to fill with knowledge. This uncomfortable uncertainty drives curiosity to know, much in the same way that can make you crazy when a friend leans over to you, leans in, pauses, and says, you know what, never mind. But the question was what to do with all this knowledge that they, that they were finding out from all of this insatiable curiosity. They, they had to publish. 
So Aldrovandi began collecting artists. He commissioned thousands of woodcuts and paintings of animals and objects, including the woodcuts showing young Antonietta and her family. He wrote thousands and thousands of words on what he had witnessed and also on what he considered worthy of inclusion. Aldrovandi went on collecting and writing until his death in 1605, at which time he bequeathed his treasures to the city of Bologna. The passion for cabinets of curiosities outlived Altravandi, lasting well into the 1700s. But all great things must come to an end, and after the passing of many of the collectors, a lot of the collections were dispersed, sold off by disinterested heirs. Some went on to become the founding collections of great museums like the Natural History Museum, British Museum in London, and the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford. <clears throat> but astonishingly, Aldrovandi's persisted. It remained more or less intact until Napoleon came through in 1796, recognized the wonders for the treasures that they were, and carted many of them off to France. But luckily for us and posterity, efforts were made in the early 1900s to reassemble the collection. And now the Aldrovandi collection at Palazzo Poggi in Bologna holds one of the, the only, last, mostly intact Renaissance wonder commerce in the world. This was from spring last year. It's well worth a visit. <clears throat> Despite his near fanatical dedication to documenting all of nature's wonders, almost none of Aldrovandi's manuscripts were published until long after his death. But when his Monstrorium Historia was finally published in 1642, it became a sensation, in particular for the illustrations. It also cemented the Gonzalez family and Anton Antonietta into scientific history forever. For centuries after his death, scholars and art lovers searched for that larger portrait that Aldrovandi had commissioned of Antonietta, the one that he had hung opposite his family portrait, but it appeared to be lost to time. But then in 2020, something miraculous happened. An antique dealer in England named Daniel Dawson Gordon purchased this very nice Madonna and child by a notable late Renaissance painter. And it's nice, it has some of the softness of Da Vinci, it's good painting. But there was something strange about it, something that aroused his suspicion. And so he invited in a colleague with an x-ray scanner and they turned it upside down and revealed what is thought to be Aldrovandi's long lost portrait of Antonietta seen for the first time just four years ago. <laughs> and so her story continues here, 426 years after she visited with a scientist in Bologna. Buried treasures are real. The work started by Aldrovandi and his peers, driven by the curiosity born of wonders, marvels, and monsters, helped kick off the scientific revolution. But it continues, and even now, the strange attraction of these things that lay at the intersection of myth and reality continue to inspire curiosity. And this year, in the middle of a dry lake bed, at one of the most wonder-filled parties in the world, people will wonder, once again ponder the mysterious and wonder whether maybe monsters are real. So please raise a glass with me. May your world be filled with known unknowns and fill your world with wonder. Yeah.